I am Dr. Ahmed Hankir. I identify as a wounded healer. I'm both a mental health care provider and NHS psychiatrist and a mental health care receiver, a psychiatric patient. I realize that revelation may make people feel uncomfortable. If it does, ask yourself, why? You see, there's this perception that doctors should be invincible. But the reality is that we are human beings, that we are fallible, and we are also vulnerable to developing mental health problems like everyone else. Stigma and a culture of shame are formidable barriers to mental health care services. And consequently, many people, especially doctors with mental health problems, continue to suffer in silence despite the availability of effective treatment. I repeat, many people with mental health problems continue to suffer in silence despite the availability of effective treatment. Now, if that was physical health, there would be outrage. But because it's mental health, there is a deafening silence. Now, I have felt the fire of stigma. So I know firsthand how harmful and hurtful it can be. And so I have decided to, de to dedicate and devote my life to campaigning against stigma and to raising awareness of the egregious effects of stigma. Indeed, the consequences of stigma can be fatal. I will be talking about suicide, which can be triggering, and I cannot emphasize enough. If you are experiencing psychological distress in any of its many forms, the best recourse is to seek professional help. This is Dr. Daksha Emson. She was a loving mother and wife and a brilliant psychiatrist. And she tragically killed herself and her baby daughter Freya during a psychotic episode. An independent inquiry into her death concluded that she was the victim of stigma in the national health service. Succinctly put, stigma is killing people. Stigma, it's killing people. Now is not the time to be quiet. We must do everything in our collective power to challenge stigma whenever and wherever we see it. How do we reduce stigma? How do we do it? A systematic review and meta-analysis reveal that the most effective way of reducing stigma is through social contact with someone who has a mental health condition. Why? Well, when you meet us, you discover that we are peace-loving, community-serving, law-abiding citizens, and that we have hopes and fears and strengths and vulnerabilities and dreams like everyone else. You discover that we are human beings. And so the evidence is clear. People who have mental health problems have the power to reduce stigma and must spearhead anti-stigma campaigns. We must amplify the voices of experts by experience and harness the colossal power of storytelling to reduce stigma and to empower, dignify, and humanize people who have mental health conditions. And so this is my story. I will never, ever forget the date, the 10th of July, 2000. I left my family behind me in Lebanon. And 
the country was ravaged by a brutal conflict that had far-reaching consequences. So there I was in Beirut International Airport. And I don't care. I don't care if what I'm about to say shatters my masculine bravado. I was crying inconsolably. Toxic masculinity permeates our societies. The male to female suicide ratio is three to one. We need to rewrite the narrative on what it means to be a strong man. Expressing your emotions and seeking help are signs of strength regardless of your gender. I arrived in England and I naively believed that I would just waltz into university and that I would be embraced by the academic community. I graduated top of the school, after all. The reality was that my qualifications from Lebanon were not recognized. So I ended up working as a janitor, cleaning floors, and as a stock advisor stacking supermarket shelves from you cannot see in the morning until you cannot see at night. I was working 70 hours a week on minimum wage to put a roof over my head and food in my stomach. The calluses on my hands, evidence of my manual labor. How did I feel? I was 17 years old. Legally speaking, I wasn't even an adult. I was just a kid. My mind was still maturing. My brain was still developing. My heart was still growing. I didn't understand why when I would say good morning to people when I was cleaning floors, people wouldn't say good morning back to me. I saw teenagers my age living with their parents, preparing for their A-levels. I felt melancholic, and of course I did. But I was fully aware that I had been given a decent shot at life because education in the UK is a birthright and that is not the reality for many people in this world. And I would admonish myself if I squandered that golden opportunity, I just have to stay focused and work really, really, and I mean really hard. And the following year, I enrolled into a sixth form college and I continued to work full time hours to survive. And I will never ever forget when the head of the sixth form at the time asked me what I wanted to do with my life and I said to her it was always my dream to become a doctor. And she laughed in my face. And she didn't have to say it but she made me feel like I was this dirty little immigrant with delusions of grandeur. She then scoffed, choose another course, you'll never get into medical school. Being the sensitive soul that I am, her words hurt me. Her words hurt me a lot. However, I didn't allow her to diminish my resolve. I continued to work hard I dug deep, and despite the constant threat that being in full-time employment posed, I received straight A grades, and I matriculated into Manchester Medical School. All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find that it was vanity, but the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they may act their dreams with open eyes to make them possible. This I did, the Lawrence of Arabia. In June 2006, when I was a third year medical student, I woke up one morning to discover that my hometown was bombed and that hundreds of people were killed overnight. My nightmare turned into a reality. My world turned upside down. I saw harrowing and horrific images of dead bodies strewn on the streets of Lebanon, dead babies being removed from the rubble. And I feared that my family were among the dead. And I later discovered they were safe. And I reacted. I was overwhelmed. I felt powerless. And I developed a severe episode of psychological distress. Now C.S. Myers in The Lancet said that everyone has a breaking point, weak or strong, cowardly or courageous, war frightened, everyone witless. And in the immortal oratory of the Joker, insanity is much like gravity. 
all it takes is a little push. How about a full-blown war? What's it like to experience major depressive disorder? Thoughts and feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness permeates your mind like a poisonous fog. The excessive guilt paralyzes you. You ruminate. You are unable to concentrate. Your mind is utterly useless. You are no longer able to conceive and to receive ideas. You have zero energy and motivation. You don't even have the will to get out of bed, let alone live life. This isn't living. This is existing. This isn't living. The somatic or physical symptoms of mental health conditions are disabling. During an anxiety attack, you cannot breathe. I cannot breathe! And the pain in my chest is so excruciating, it reduces me to tears. You develop this sense of impending doom and you are terrified. You are about to die. Debilitating though, the symptoms of psychological distress are. The stigma is far, far worse. I was shunned, ostracized, and dehumanized even by those who I thought were my closest companions at the time when I needed care and compassion the most, I received ridicule and rejection. I was forced to interrupt my studies. I was rendered impoverished and hopeless and homeless. And I was sinking deeper and deeper into the darkness. And in my despair, and isolation, I contemplated ending that which is most precious itself, human life. However, I resisted the urge to act upon these seductive suicidal thoughts because suicide is forbidden in Islam. And being a practicing Muslim deterred me from ending my life. My faith was a protective factor. I eventually sought informal support from my imam in my local mosque, and he urged me to seek professional help from an NHS psychiatrist, which is what I did. And together we co-produced a treatment plan. There is so much pill shaming, and I think that is wrong. Many report psychiatric drugs are life-saving, but medication is not a panacea. And there are adverse effects which can be intolerable, unbearable, and we must be clear about this. The psychiatric drugs worked for so many others, but they didn't work for me. Not a bio, bio, bio model of mental health. It's a biopsychosocial model that incorporates art therapy. And it was the power of the performing arts that saved me from suicide. Expressing my emotions through the vehicle of the performing arts was validating, therapeutic, and cathartic, and contributed to my mental health recovery, and continues to contribute to my mental health resilience. I remember when I received an invitation to perform at the International Anthony Burgess Foundation in Manchester back in 2008. This was during my recovery and discovery. It was the first time that I performed on a stage. I cannot explain it. I was beholden to the spur. I felt the urge to recite poetry or reenact scenes from films from Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night, but rage, rage against the dying of the light. And though they go mad, they shall be sane. Though they sink through the sea, they shall rise again. Though lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. To Blade Runner, I have seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watch sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All those moments will disappear like these tears in the rain. To the dark night, oh! So you think the darkness is your ally? You merely adopted the dark. I was born in it, molded by it. I didn't see the light until I was already a man. By then it was nothing but blinding to me. Your shadows betray you because they belong to me. Through the medium 
of the performing arts, I could convey the rage, the pathos, the despair, the hope, the exuberance that I experienced whilst at the throes of profound oscillations and mood. I didn't develop adverse effects and I didn't feel judged. I could connect with others after I was forced into isolation for so long. I felt alive again. And it was the most wonderful, wonderful feeling. I gradually recovered. And I resumed medical school with a renewed determination. There was a fire burning in my belly and thunder in my heart to realize my potential and to make important and meaningful contributions to our world. And against all the odds, I finally qualified. But my journey had only just begun. For I had been humiliated for so long and I was inspired to work above and beyond the call of duty. And all the hard work and all the heartache and all the suffering and all the sacrifices paid off. Because from leaving my family behind me when I was 17 years old, to arriving to the UK, to cleaning floors, to stacking shelves, to getting into medical school, to experiencing severe psychological distress triggered by the Lebanon war, to being forced to interrupt my studies, to being rendered impoverished and hopeless and homeless, to recovering, to resuming medical school, to qualifying. In 2013, I received the Royal College of Psychiatrists Foundation Doctor of the Year Award, and the Royal College of Psychiatrists Awards marked the highest level of achievement in psychiatry in the UK. Not bad for a madman, right? It was one of the proudest moments of my life. And just in case people thought I was lucky, I went and I did it again. And I got the Royal College of Psychiatrists Doctor of the Year Award in 2018. And my story is further evidence to prove that people who have mental health conditions can not only recover and function again, we can be the best at what we do. And now, whenever I'm at the workplace and someone says good morning to me, regardless of if they are a professor, or a janitor, I always say good morning back to them with a big smile on my face and in my heart. And I will close with these take-home messages that it's okay not to be okay. That having mental health problems is nothing to be ashamed about. That seeking help is a sign of strength and not a sign of weakness. That recovery is the reality for the many and not for the few. And I invite you to stand in solidarity with us to reduce stigma and to contribute to this cultural revolution to empower, dignify, and humanize people who have mental health conditions. If I can recover and realize my dreams, other people out there with mental health conditions can recover and realize their dreams too. Thank you. Thank you so much.